cry. It's going to last 10 minutes. This is the man we're talking about today. And his photograph is already on the board. And those of you in the class can see this one. Okay, it looks like, um, who is sitting behind Bolari? You cannot see, you cannot see. The head is too big. You need to come in front. I've always told you those short ones who like to sit at the back, Sammy Flex and the rest. I told you to always come to the front of the class. Why do you like to sit always at the back? Now there is Bola Ray sitting in front of you with a big head and you can't see. Oh, DKB is also sitting next to Bola Ray. What is happening in the class today? Yes. It's the African History Club. Yeah, boy. Yeah, boy. My God have mercy. I want to say thank you so much. I do appreciate you. Some people just walked into the class as well. I want to say thank you to all you wonderful people. Priscilla Nado Dua uh, Dodu is right here in the African History Class. Kenneth, Kenneth Atu Bilson is the MGG sales manager right here in the African History Class. Kenneth Atu Bilson. My God have mercy. Right here in the African History Class. We want to say we love you. We appreciate you. Bernard Benjamin Mingle is also in class. Ah, I see you at Dote Tito. At Dote Tito. I like to say Tito. All right. So I see you, Priest Leonardo. Do I do? Do. My God have mercy. I see you right here in the African history class. I want to say thank you so much. Today. Nia Bo Aye is uh, sitting close to a woman. I need to get closer and know who this woman is. Uh, wh wh what did you say? She's called what? Oh, Regina Hughes. Oh, Regina Hughes. That's your wife. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, so he's sitting very close to his wife, Regina Hughes. Yeah, Thank you so much. We appreciate you and we love you. Yeah, Last Kobe yeah, is a trot trot driver inside our wishy. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you. Time now for the class. Yeah. Today we are talking about a man whose life is about to change your own lives. Today we are talking about a man by name Medga Evers. Medga Evers. Medga is spelled M-E-D-G-A-R. Evers is E-V-E-R-S. He was actually born Medga Wiley. Evers and Wiley is spelled W I L E Y. Wiley, Medgar Wiley Evers. His life is about to change your life. Listen, now he was born on the second day of July in 1925. Yes, 1925, about 32 years before this country called Ghana was born out of the Gold Coast in independence. Today we're talking about Medgar Evers. In fact, Medgar Evers was born on the, 20th, on the 2nd day of July in 1925 and he was born in Mississippi in a small town called Decatur. Decatur, D-E-C-A-T-U-R. In Mississippi, he was the third of five children from his father and mother. His mother was called Jesse Wright and the father was called James Evers. Now James was a sawmill operator and he made quite some money to feed his family and to feed himself. In fact, it was in the days when schools in America were segregated. White people went only to white schools and black people went to only black schools. So he had to walk with his brothers 12 miles, the equivalent of 19 kilometers, to go to school in a segregated area right there in Mississippi. My brother, my sister, now in 1942, he decided that he was going to join the United States Army in 1942. My brother, my sister, 1942. 1942. Oh, my God have mercy. 1942. He decided to join the United States Army. And when he joined the United States Army, that was around the World War. He was sent to the European Theater where he participated in the Normandy landings in June 1944. And remember 1944 was the same year Peter Tosh was born. That's how we study history. When the days come up, you should be able to link them up to other events that happen students. Hear me now. Now after the end of the war, Evers was honorably discharged as a sergeant. Now in the army, those of you who know this, if you are honorably discharged, given permission to rest, it means that you can still carry yourself as an ex-soldier man. But if you are not honorably discharged, if you are sacked, you can never mention it anywhere that you have ever been part of the army. 
Even in Ghana, these laws still hold. That is why um, some people who joined the army some time ago but were dishonorably discharged or sacked cannot be called army officers or ex-army officers. My brother, my sister, that's the reason. Today we're talking about Medgar Evers. Now, Medgar Evers joined the United States Army. He went for the World War. And he was honorably discharged in 1948. Evers enrolled at Alcon Agricultural and Mechanical College, where he came out with his first degree, a Bachelor of Arts degree, my brother, my sister. Oh, what a thing. Now, that school is a historically black college. My brother, my sister is now called the Alcon State University. He majored in business administration, and he came out with a BA, oh my God, with honors. He was earned the Bachelor of Arts degree in 1952. My brother, my sister, after spending four years in the university, on December 24, a day before Christmas in 1951, Evers married his own classmate at the university, Merle Beasley. Keep this name in your head. Merle Beasley. Merle is spelled M Y R. L-I-E for Merle and Beasley is B-E-A-S-L-E-Y. Now together, they had three children. Darrell Kenyatta, Rena Dennis, and James Van Dyke Evers. The story is about to get thick. Now, our hero for today, Medgar Evers and his wife decided to move out of Decatur and move to another part of Mississippi known as Mount Bayou. Mount Bayou is a part of Mississippi. My brother, my sister, and here they developed a very strong link in some serious activism fighting for black people in those days remember that uh, black people were not allowed to go to just any school they wanted uh, but they had to be relegated to black schools located in the ghettos today they don't call them ghettos they call them the inner cities my brother my sister hear me now the devil has a very nice way of making dirty things sound good a dirty film they say adult movies or blue movie my brother my sister how did boxing ever become a sport and there's something called slap contest. It's also a sport. They even have UHF, or is it UCF, or is it QRB, kicking and punching each other and breaking each other's teeth. They call that a sport. My God have mercy, the devil is at work. Hear me now. Listen. In 1954, three years before this country gained its independence from the Gold Coast and became Ghana, there was a Supreme Court decision in America that segregated public schools were unconstitutional and black people were allowed to go to white schools and white people were allowed to go to black schools. Now, how many of us remember the Ku Klux Klan? It is a white supremacist group, yes, a white supremacist group that is always targeting black people, killing black people in America, and doing so many distantly things to the development of black people. Hear me now. Now they started the activism of pushing black people into white schools. And I'm talking about our hero for today, Medgar Evers and his wife. And because of that, they were targeted by the Ku Klux Klan and other white supremacist groups. Hear what happened now. Now on November 24 of 1954 Evers was named as the NWACP's first field secretary for Mississippi and the NWACP is a black outfit my brother my sister is still ex uh, existent the National Association of uh, I mean uh, uh, black people coming together to be able to uh, push black activities around the world my brother my sister in this position he helped organize boycotts and set up new chapters of the NWACP Evers was also invest, involved with James Meredith. How many of us remember James Meredith? He was a man who applied to go to the Mississippi University. And he was denied just because he was black. I'm going to show you a photograph of uh, uh, James Meredith. He was relegated to the corridor of the class. He was not allowed to be part of the classroom. He would have to sit outside the classroom and be touched through the window. All because he was black. James Meredith. My producer is going to show you a photograph of James Meredith hiding in the corner. My brother, my sister. And that's James Meredith. My brother, my sister. This is the man. An old photograph of, 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 of him. He was not allowed. Some of them were just allowed to sit outside. 
Whilst white people were in the class, they would have to be taught through the windows. They would have to look into the classrooms and take their lectures from out of the windows. They were seen as dirty people just because they were black. And when it was time to feed in the dining hall, they were not allowed to go in. White people had to go eat, finish eating, leave the dining hall before they would go and eat crumbs from off the table. Hear me now. This is the class. So when James Meredith tried to enroll into the University of Mississippi in the early 1960s, our hero was part of those that pushed him very hard to be able to go through. Now there was another man who tried so much to also get admission into the universities, but he was also disallowed. And our hero and his wife and the NWACP pushed them. And I'm talking about Clyde Kennard. He was a Korean, African American man. My brother, my sister, we're going to find time and talk about all these wonderful people. Now, how many of us remember Emmett Till? Emmett Till was a teenager, a little boy who was killed only because he spoke to a white woman why should a dirty black boy speak to a white woman in fact the mob beat him up until they kill him show me a photograph of Emmett Till now Emmett Till was a little boy and he was killed by a mob that's Emmett Till that's the photograph of Emmett Till he was killed in fact our hero for today um Edgar Medgar Evers pushed for justice for all these people. Whilst he was fighting for justice, he was targeted by the Ku Klux Klan and targeted by white supremacist group. They, at the point, even decided to attack him with a Molotov cocktail. How many of us know that? Petrol bombs. The technical name is Molotov cocktail. My brother, my sister, they threw that into the carport of his home. They attacked him several times until he reported to the police and the FBI started to give him some kind of protection following him in and out of every meeting that he went to. This is the photograph of his home. And you see where the green grass is, that was where they dropped the bomb, the Molotov cocktail. In fact, he lived there with his wife and his children. His children were little, little children at the time that all these things were happening. He sought police protection and the FBI and the police will accompany him wherever he went. But listen to what happened now. My brother, my sister, he complained to his wife that he felt that his life was going to be short. He wrote several stories about his life. And he even wrote in his diary that he did not think that he would live to even be 50. My brother, my sister, I see if it was a prophecy. That was exactly what happened to him. Now hear me now. Evers lived with the constant threat of death. A large white supremacist population and the Ku Klux Klan were present in Jackson and East suburbs and they targeted him every day and every night. Now the risk was so high that before his death, Evers and his wife Miley had trained their children on what to do in case of shooting, bombing, and any other kind of attack. His children were supposed to do this and to do that. They even taught their children how to handle the gun at the age of just five and even six. They taught their children how to use the gun because the threat on their lives were just too humongous. Hear me now. This is the African history class. Watch me now. Now hear what happened now. Now in the early morning of Wednesday, the 12th day of June, 1963, this was when Ghana was just about to do something interesting. Remember the OAU that was founded? My brother, my sister, that was around the same time. Now listen to what happened. Just hours after President John F. Kennedy's nationality. In fact, um, a speech was delivered. He was talking to Americans to be more patriotic and to stand by the American flag. This was broadcast nationally. My brother, my sister, he also talked about civil rights address and all that thing. He was pulled into his delivery, my brother, my sister, delivery shop, where he was supposed to pick up a few things. He picked up one or two things, and then he drove all the way into his house. But this time round, the FBI did not accompany him. They were supposed to be accompanying him. He waited and waited when he came out of the delivery shop. No policeman was around. They had all deserted him. And he felt that his life was threatened. He quickly had to leave the shop. When he left and pulled in his driveway, 
after returning from a meeting with the NWACP lawyers, there was a gunshot that he heard. And this gunshot, my brother, my sister, was so tremendous. Mm -mm -mm. The gun blazed. My brother, my sister, it was a shot that was so strong and dangerous. It hit him right in the chest, penetrated his heart. He fell down immediately by the force of the gun. This is the gun that was used to shoot him. That is the photo of the gun. Now you need to log on to our Facebook page so you can see this. And when you look at it, it has that telescope right in front of it. It's a rifle. My brother, my sister, you will look into it and you will not miss the target. The one who shot him, shot him straight in the heart. And when he fell, he got up and walked about 30 centimeters. In fact, 30 meters, I beg your pardon. And then he fell again. His wife had the thud from outside and ran outside to go and check him up. And he, she quickly put him in a car and drove straight to the hospital. Now, what hospital did they go to? My brother, my sister, this is terrible. And I need you to listen with rapt attention. He was shot. And they rushed him all the way to the Mississippi hospital. And when they got to the hospital, my brother, my sister, they turned him away. He was dying and bleeding. They said black people are not allowed in this hospital. It is an all-white hospital. Take him away. The wife started to wail and to cry. She started to shout and say, do you know who this man is? This is Medgar Evers. This is the NWACP's secretary. Before he was allowed into the hospital, my brother, my sister, about 50 minutes later, exactly 52 minutes later, he died. He died. He died. Yellow. He died Yellow. from the bullet fired from an Eddystone Enfield 1917 rifle. And that was the rifle. My brother, my sister, he was buried right there. This is the rifle. And he was buried, my brother, my sister, with full military honors before a crowd of over 3,000 people at the Arlington National Cemetery. And this is his gravestone. And you'll see his name written on it. Medgar uh, W. Evers, Mississippi, and World War II veteran. And the date of his birth and when he died on the 12th day of June in 1963. Today, my brother, my sister, we remember this great man. But listen to this. After his death, his wife decided to go to court. And when she went to court, it was an all-white jury. It means all the judges were white. They all decided to throw out the case. Who was the man who shot our hero for today? He was called what? He was called Byron Dilla Beckwith. Byron Dilla Beckwith. My producer is going to put up a photograph of Byron Dilla Beckwith. So you see the killer of Medgar Evers. Byron is spelled B Y R O N Dilla. That's D E and then L A. Beckwith is B E C K W I T H. Byron Dilla Beckwith, he was the one who fired that 1917 rifle right into the heart of our hero for today. My brother, my sister, he died and was buried at the Arlington Cemetery. My brother, my sister, the Arlington National Cemetery, where he received full military honors before a crowd of over 3,000 people. Now, the Arlington National Cemetery is one of the two cemeteries in the United States National Cemetery System that are maintained by the United States Army. Nearly 400,000 people are buried in it, and it has about 700 acres of land, my brother, my sister, and it's in Arlington in Virginia. Today, my brother, my sister, when they went to court, they threw out the case because it was an all-white jury. They had to wait for 30 years. The good thing they did, the military decided to embalm the body, the dead body of our hero, Medgar Evers. So they actually embalmed him using the Egyptian style of embalmment in what is known as the sarcophagus. I say it again, Black Rasta. Say it again, sarcophagus. Yeah! Hear me now. Sacrophagus. In fact, the coffin is known as the sacrophagus. And the embalmment was done in the Egyptian way. So for 30 years, the body never got rotten. And after 30 years, when black people started sitting in the Supreme Court, my brother, my sister of America, the wife again went back to court. And this time around, they asked for the exhumation. 
to exhume the body of our hero. So this is the photograph of the man who shot and killed our hero. After 30 years of killing Medgar Evers, this is the man, his name is Byron Dilla Beckwith. He shot and killed him. After 30 years, when he was walking free and he felt everything was okay, they went back to court. The wife pushed charges and boom! This time around, black people were sitting in the courthouse and then he was incriminated. Oh my God have mercy. And sentenced to life imprisonment. He died whilst in jail. My brother, my sister, justice was finally delivered, but after 30 years. But look at the interesting thing that happened. Remember his children were little, little children. Two years, one year, four years at the time of his death. So they didn't really know their father. But because of the embalmment, the father's body, body was not rotten. The children, now 34, 35, 37, were able to go to the cemetery when the body was exhumed and they saw the face of their father for the first time in 30 years. In their ripe ages, they broke down and shed tears. Today we remember you, Papa. Yeah, Papa. Papa, we see me now, Papa. Papa, where are you, Papa? Papa, we see me now, Papa, we see where are you, Papa? Papa, we see family Kowate. Papa, we see me now, Papa, Missy Famico, what day? Papa, Missy Vinico, Papa. Papa, Missy Vinico. Papa, Missy Vinico, Papa. Yeah, Papa, Missy Vinico. Papa, Missy Vinico. Yeah, Papa. Oh, Papa. Yeah, Papa. In the burden of knowledge, my brother, my sister. Now that you know what would you do, be an enemy, you lay a mini of our fear, Zunda Kagani, Mezaka Yine. Be an enemy, you lay a mini of our fear. Yesunda kagane bezaka yire ye ampa bango boka ye nang fifi ye nyanu kai na woba na ye webeden. He died at the young age of thirty-seven. He didn't even reach forty, let alone fifty. He left behind three little children who did not even know him, aside just calling him dada, dada, daddy, daddy, daddy. After thirty years of his death, justice was delivered. His children were able to see his corpse. Oh, Papa, Miss Emilio Bacovate. Papa, Miss Emilio Baco. Papa, Miss Emilio Bacovate. Yeah, Papa, Miss Emilio Baco. Papa, Miss Emilio Baco. Papa, Miss Emilio Baco. Yeah, Papa. Yeah, Papa. Miss Emilio Baco. Papa, bye bye, what? Papa, bye bye, yeah, Papa. Papa, bye bye, 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 Papa, bye bye,